Good evening. Um, it's Vicky here from Dublin Maker, and we're back for this evening's uh, session uh, with uh, South Dublin Radio Club. We also have Jeffrey um, and Laura here from the Dublin Maker team. Uh, for those who don't know about Dublin Maker, uh, we run Maker Festival every year, except for this year because of COVID, it got postponed to next summer. So we decided to, you know, to, we, we missed all the makers, so why not run, um, you know, a maker related event? Like uh, this week, we're doing a maker a day. And as I said tonight, we have um adrian and dermot from south dublin radio club um if you want to give say a few words um i'll leave you to it and then we can head to the the, the session then thanks very much vicky and thanks for having myself and dermot tonight from south dublin radio club um we actually have a small intro about what we do in the video so um we might go to that first and then we can pick up on any questions then after that Hi there, my name's Adrian from South Dublin Radio Club and welcome to our contribution to Science Week and tonight we're going to have a little bit of fun with radio. So as radio amateurs we have fun with the radio spectrum, that's what we do. Uh, we have fun from very low frequencies on the radio spectrum right through to shortwave where we bounce signals off the ionosphere around the planet to try and communicate with other people. Um, right through to VHF and UHF where you find your FM radio stations and your TV signals and your GPS and Wi-Fi. We love experimenting with all those different types of uh, radio technologies and building that type of infrastructure ourselves. Um, in fact, there's even amateur satellites up there which have been, you know, crowdfunded and uh, launched and um, yeah, we, we, we mess around. I don't have the sound like on my too. side anyway. And in <laughs> fact, members of this club have even facilitated local schools. Um, it is speaking with astronauts yeah. on the International no, Space I'm, Station yeah. um, and I'm amateur radio video. clubs around the world <laughs> frequently get involved in uh, you know, projects like that. You can kind of. So many of us who are interested in amateur radio uh, have a radio license, um, and that license permits us to transmit across the radio spectrum. Um, after all, the radio spectrum is very valuable real estate and uh, it's heavily regulated. In Ireland, it's regulated by Comreg. So you need to know what you're doing when you're transmitting signals, especially to make sure that you're not interfering with anybody else, whether they're commercial units, uh, users like um, broadcasters or aircraft or even emergency services. So you do need a radio license to transmit um, and there's a, an exam you need to do uh, to give you that privilege. It's not a very onerous exam, but there's an exam nonetheless. However, most of us who go out into radio um, did so by listening. Now, traditionally, uh, listening meant uh, listening to a shortwave radio and trying to pick out distant signals from far-flung parts of the world. Um, and then that spurred many people on to get their license so they could talk back to the people transmitting those signals, be it through voice or digitally, or even with Morse code. Uh, Morse code is still quite popular. Um, however, these days, listening means different things as well. Um, you know, in this computer age, this electronic age, um, we have these inexpensive software defined receivers, They're essentially small electronic radios. And um, some of them are as small as USB dongles and they cost 20 or 30 euro. Um, and you can listen to all sorts of digital transmissions with those as well and decode them. Um, and you can have a bit of fun with that. Um, and that's what we're going to do now. We're, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how you can actually decode um, uh, weather images being sent from NOAA satellites, which are, which are American um, weather satellites, which orbit the Earth continuously imaging the planet. Um, and it's fun. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a, it's a bit tricky sometimes to try and get those images because those satellites are moving. Um, but with some free software um, and a software defined radio, uh, I hope to be able to show you how you can get some images. And the other part I'm going to show you is how to make a very um, inexpensive antenna or aerial to pull those signals in. Okay. So the antenna is very straightforward. It's called a V-shaped dipole and you just need a few components for this and we'll go through those now. So a dipole is a two-legged antenna. So for this antenna, you'll need some steel wire, um, probably about two to four mils thick uh, and just narrow enough that it will fit into a chocolate block uh, connector. You'll then need a SMA connector. Um, the SMA connector is standard um, 
for most software defined receivers um, and that's important uh, when you get a software defined receiver just check uh, the connection type on it uh, but generally it's what's called an SMA connector it's a smaller coax connector you'll then need a chocolate block connector and um, so that just has two terminals in it that you screw uh, into and I'll show you how you attach uh, the coax to it and then the antenna legs of the dipole that's that's where basically the antenna dipole goes to the coax that's the connection is made across the chocolate block connector you will need 50 ohm coax that's the standard coax in um kind of radio projects and uh, that type of equipment so this type of coax is called rg58 i'm trying to get it to the camera there so you can have a look at it um, and you can order that online it's it's fairly cheap um, then you'll need some sort of um, pole uh, a non-conductive pole uh, made of wood or plastic so a broom handle in this case i have a, a piece of a plumbing a pipe um, a pvc or something like that i can't remember um, uh, something that you can attach the dipole to and then uh, put it up in the air and um, that will depend on your situation how long you want that to be and obviously it depends on your situation how long your coax needs to be to go from the antenna to the software defined receiver and then just a screw just to screw the chocolate block connector to the um the mass pole tools that you'll need uh wire cutters or snips blade or a coax stripper just to strip down the coax to put on the SMA connector and to strip off the other end of the coax to uh, attach to the chocolate block um, screwdriver um, just to screw the, the uh, chocolate block to the mast and uh, a crimping tool and that's used to um, attach the SMA connector to the coax and then a software defined receiver so this is my software defined receiver it's called an sdr play rsp2 now this would be a mid-range receiver cost wise uh, you could get an sdr dongle probably one of the most popular ones it's what's called an rtl dongle i saw one on aliexpress for about 21 euro um, and these would be in the frequency range for satellites so those higher frequency ranges where satellites are so that fm um, kind of VHF to UHF range so you can see there on the side of my SDR is are the um, SMA um, ports for the uh, coax so they're female ports and so will be a male SMA connector and on the other side of it was a USB um, connection um, to go to uh, the computer Okay, so make the antenna start off, get your coax, and on one end, mark off 10 millimeters. So then using your coax stripper or a blade, just take off the outer layer, the coax, the rubberized layer, um, and try not to damage the braided um, metal underneath the, uh, the outer shield of the coax. Um, you need that. Um, so take off the outer layer, and then push back the uh, the outer shield. Um, you're going to use that later. With your SMA connector, there'll be a ring in the packet like so. Just so put that on first. With the center part of the coax, mark off three millimeters um, of what's called a dielectric. Um, again, that's a synthetic material. So with a coax strip or a blade, um, take that off that three millimeters again try not to damage the center part of the coax it's either a wire um, solid wire or stranded wire and you can see it there okay so this is now for insertion into the sma connector in the sma connector there's a pin that may need to be pushed out by a pen or something like that but this pin is going to go over that center wire of the coax and that's for reinsertion back inside the SMA connector. And that's essentially then your male connector done. Slide down like so. And then the outer braid of the coax, push that back over um, the connector.
And then the ring that we put aside and um, put on initially, that's why we put on initially, we bring it back over and that slides over the outer uh, braid of the coax. So that outer braid of the coax is actually one half of the dipole. It connects to one half of the aerial. Then we use our crimping tool and that's what that ring is for, is basically to secure the whole uh, connector to the coax. Like, then just get some tape just, just as a temporary fix as well, just to make sure it all stays together. Just Gorilla tape or duct tape or whatever. Now get the other end of the coax here. I strip off about 30 mils. Um, again, keeping the outer braid intact and push that back um, as well. And you're actually going to twist this into a wire. As I said earlier, this is one half of the coax that's going to connect to the dipole and again with your coax strippers or blade or whatever um, you're going to take off the uh, inner dielectric so there now you can see you have, you have two wires so they go into the chocolate block connector so you just screw those into the chocolate block connector So now you're going to get your antenna wire. So remember um, from the instructions, these have been um, pre-cut um, for 137 megahertz. Okay, so the length is 53.4 centimeters or 534 millimeters uh, each one. So uh, these ones I got actually back off the back of an IKEA um, shelf uh, thing for the shed anyway. Um, so they bend quite easily and as you can see it just made an L at the end of them just to bend them into the uh, into the chocolate block connector. So you'll see what it looks like now when I put it together. So they'll come out in a V from the chocolate block connector. Now they need to be at 120 degrees. Um, so what I did was I have a workbench. I just it was a bit fiddly with the protractor so i just marked it off in two lines 120 degrees uh, angle um and then i just used that as a as a guide um when i was pushing uh the two legs of the dipole into the chocolate block connector so as you can see it's fairly rudimentary stuff just screw them together tighten them up So the next thing then uh, is to secure them to the mast or the pole. So as you can see here, it's a little power screwdriver and I always make things a little bit easier. So screwed it in. Um, I actually found that I needed some cable ties just to make it a little bit more secure and um, also to secure the coax going down uh, the pole. And what I did at the end was I got a uh, an old um, extendable mop handle and stuck that onto it and then I have a camera tripod and I just tied it to that and stuck it out the window. This website or this uh, web page uh, LNA for all uh, this guy has a stepwise guide as to how you can make this antenna as well and pretty much this is the path that I'm following here tonight and it gives you the dimensions and what to expect and so on so it's just a reference for you there so the next thing to do then is to get the software so the WX to IMG so WX is for weather to image there's a few websites that have it this one is called RASA I think it's the German website but if you just type in WX to IMG you'll find it on the internet now uh, you want to download the beta version for this which was the last updated version this this actual software is, is old enough now i think it's 10 years old but it's still very good and this is what people use so it's it's, it's quite capable so you just want to open up that and install it and just put it wherever you want to put it on your computer and as you can see uh, then it generates a shortcut on your desktop and then you can just go ahead and uh, install and click the preferences um, as I'm going to show you now. 
so if this is a fresh install it'll ask you for geographical details um, your location so we can do this under options so then we want to go to um, ground station location and if you put in your city and your your country uh, it will give the latitude and longitude for that now I know my exact position so um, most all radio people do anyway um, you, you, you have to give your station location uh, it's quite easy to do there's there's lots of um, websites where you can put in your address and get your exact location but either way just click OK so we'll go to options and we'll go to first active APT satellites and we'll just make sure that all the different NOAA satellites are checked and then we want to go to internet options which is here and uh, we need to get Kepler's from Celis track this is to just to do with orbits of different body bodies artificial satellites and so on in relation to uh, Earth so then go to reporting options and what we want to do is record only when active satellite overhead that that's checked and pick a virtual um, a cable output or virtual audio cable now um, you'll need a, a virtual audio cable because that's basically what um, pipes um, the signal um, into your software defined receiver um, or sorry from your software defined receiver into this software um, to decode the signal um, now you can go to uh, VB audio cable uh, online and install that so here's VB audio cable um, and there's a free download for that um, it's pretty straightforward uh, to install and um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward to install there's lots of videos um, on YouTube how to do this as well it's, it's very straightforward um, the thing about the free version is it only allows you one feed at a time whereas the purchase version allows um, multiple instances of the virtual audio cable so once you're happy that you have VB audio cable selected click OK and then under file you want to update the captors and you can see it doing that down here so sorry and just to go back um, the active APT satellites uncheck NOAA 17 um, then if you go to file um, if you go to satellite pass list based on the geographic information uh, you can see the upcoming passes for your local area so we can see that uh, NOAA 19 um, is the next one due here local time that's the duration of the pass is 11 minutes on 137 uh, megahertz as you can see there And there's the direction north the MEL is the maximum elevation so generally you don't you know you don't want satellites that are close to the horizon and um, especially if you have hills um, and that kind of thing um, you know uh, it's more difficult clearly if they're going straight over your head you get a longer pass and uh, a clearer signal so we're recording then you click on record you want to check that uh, record and auto process is checked and that create image is checked and under image settings there's a lot of um, 
different um, elements of the image you can select to be processed. Uh, so, um, infrared elements, you know, vegetation, thermal. Uh, there's a lot of stuff selected by default. Um, so it's up to you. So whatever, whatever you want. Um, click set, and then when you hit auto record. You can see down the bottom there, it's there, it's waiting for that next satellite, now at 19 northbound at 88 degree elevation on that frequency, which is the 137 frequency we're making the antenna for. So that's pretty much how the software works. So the next thing then to do is to connect everything up. So you have your antenna made, that needs to be connected to your software defined receiver. And then you need to connect the software defined receiver to your PC or your laptop. So that makes the whole system then. Um, just regarding the uh, software defined receiver software, as you saw in the last section, I used SDR Uno. There's lots of different types of um, software defined receiver uh, software uh, or interface. Um, and it's a preference thing really, but they generally work with all the different types of receivers okay so the next step will be to open up your software defined receiver uh, software so i use as you saw earlier in the video an sdr play um, and pretty much all the sdr software looks the same um you know you use it to press play or something to get it going and then you have to select the frequency so um, if you look down here at the on the bottom of my screen here you'll see basically the, the, the frequency counter as it's called or the, the, the tuner and um, so we want to select the frequency of 137 and um, in line with whatever um, the next satellite pass uh, tells you on the satellite list on WX to IMG. So that's the receiver active, and um, you'd want to set it to uh, maybe wide FM or that's WFM there, or medium FM or narrow FM. Um, you probably want a bandwidth of around 45 kilohertz. So you can see with this one it's about 47.4 see where if i click there it says bw that's the bandwidth um, so that's probably okay so what what do you mean by bandwidth so signals are a certain width in hertz um, or kilohertz or megahertz okay so um you have bandwidth because outside of the channel that you create you basically reject all the other um, signals or information out there or noise or whatever um, so for this one we want a bandwidth of about 45 so if you can see here where it says bw where i'm writing it bring it up to 45 um, uh, kilohertz so there you can see that this is the fine control down here for this so the next thing you want to do is to make sure that the audio from your SDR is going to the WX to IMG software, which is the decoding software we just set up for the satellite. Um, so in other words, from this software, the software defined receiver to the, uh, the satellite software. And um, so normally you, it, it, a setting is uh, for output somewhere in the software defined receiver software and um, in this which is SDR Uno it's here in settings if you go to out you can see you can select the different audio uh, outputs so we want VB audio cable and then we wait for the satellite to pass overhead here on my own desktop which have it configured that I can see the software defined um, receiver software and the WX to IMG software so all you need to do because you've done this already is done the main settings is just go to file go to record 
and then make sure that record and auto process are checked and create images are checked so it automatically processes the data it gets from the satellite and creates the weather images from it and then you just hit auto record and then you can see their status is waiting for the next satellite on this frequency which is 13762 um, at this time so just to go to your software defined radio just to make sure that your um, the correct frequency is in so it's always in the bottom 13762 I just messed around with it there so just 13762 so 137 megahertz 0.620 kilohertz um, and then it waits and as you can see over here on the right hand side of the WX2 IMG uh, software and um, the box uh, it says uh, all receivers record and this is a countdown so it's 26 minutes to the next satellite and it's completely automated from here once you clicked that file record button um, it takes over it will um, decode the signal and then process the images um, it takes about 15 minutes um, for a satellite pass uh, you have your correct frequency in if you keep an eye on the waterfall here just speed it up we don't want to do the full 15 minutes obviously you'll see the signal intensity build and beginning to rise there as the satellite approaches and then if you can look at the w x img software you can see image beginning to form there so it's, it's black and white now those images will be rendered in the post processing that we checked earlier on depending on the quality of the signal that you received this was a so-so pass got some partial data and if you can see there in the bottom right hand corner um, of uh, image um, i have a website called satellite open um, and you can pretty much type in any satellite there it'll give you a trajectory of the satellite you know expected passes for your location there's a few websites like that but it's kind of neat as the satellite moves the intensity of the signal um, meeting the antenna is going to change for want of a better term and what you may want to do if you can is actually just slightly twist your antenna and that that's actually tracking the satellite in some ways and you can you can keep an eye on your software to find receiver you can watch the signal signal intensity go up and down um, and if you give it a little twist and the signal comes up a little bit that's fine if you twist it and the signal goes down, that means your antennas are mo moving away from the satellite. If we go into the images that were downloaded from that satellite pass, that was NOAA 18. Go into saved images and you can see here, this looks like an infrared, MCIR infrared. I'm not sure what NO is, but it looks like a multi-spectral image. Um, but you can see across the one, two, three, four images that were created by this satellite pass you can see where the data coming from the satellite was strongest as it was coming from the south and just as it passed overhead otherwise it's pretty grainy and that's pretty much because the satellite is imaging and transmitting pretty much simultaneously so if you were in Iceland for example you would see the images over Iceland as the satellite passed um, so if we just click into this one and um, this is the infrared image so this image is taken at night time so this is the first of November it's at 9 p.m. and but you can see the cloud formations very well over uh, Britain and continental Europe and Ireland it's been raining pretty heavily all day and um, actually now if we go into this one and um, you can see I would take it that these are the intensity of the rain clouds you can see it's raining pretty heavily um, but I'm open to correction on that it's just my interpretation um, so that's pretty neat um, and you have a contrast image here you can see the cloud formations a bit better um, and this X is obviously my location so yeah that's pretty much it and then there's some other ones I'm not an expert in this but as you can see there's some pretty decent images there um, from a very basic antenna um, and a very simple uh, receiver. Well, there you have it, you've managed to download an image from a passing weather satellite. Okay, it was a bit grainy in parts and um, 
good quality over Ireland but north and south of our location not so good but that's more a function of the antenna it's a very basic antenna and um, with a better antenna you will get better images um, and obviously with an antenna that would track you get really good images and, uh, and just to say actually those images were recorded um, while my antenna was actually inside my attic because it was a stormy night on the 1st of November and um, so there you go even in the house we managed to get some uh, relatively good images and uh, as a bonus now having done that project you now have a software defined receiver and uh, that receiver and the software opens up an entire literal spectrum of signals um, and different types of communication that you can explore and experiment with and yeah it's 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 a whole unseen world that's whizzing by your head all the time and this is uh, my uh, software defined receiver now uh, running down on the short wave part of the spectrum uh, on what's called the 40 meter band and as you can see there there's stacks of signals um, down this end these these are all morse code this is on a monday morning by the way um, this is a, a, a digital si uh, set of signals called ft8 and um, these are more amateur signals um, and you can see there's uh, lots of people in there transmitting away um, let me just zoom back out uh, these are all voice signals there's some more digital stuff there don't know what that is um, up here there's commercial broadcasters that's outside the band but it's just a scope so you can begin to investigate all these different things uh, just from your own computer and sticking an antenna up it doesn't even have to be outside it can be inside uh, there's so many different types of uh, signals whizzing around out there as i said earlier on from satellites to shortwave communications to you know maybe spy stations there's those kind of weird things out there that people listen to as well um, and there's so much information out there on the internet as well um, on YouTube and on websites and of course you've got your local radio clubs as well like ourselves and South Dublin Radio Club and um, to give you advice and to join in with us these days online you can join in with us and um, and there's radio clubs in your location as well and um, so go to the one that's local to you you'll find lots of people there that are willing to help you out and give you advice and then if you become really interested in this type of thing then you might consider going for a radio license and that gives you the rights and privileges to start sending your own signals around the planet and out into space and um, you know there's a uh, as I said earlier, we communicate with the International Space Station. There's actually a new thing on the International Space Station called a cross-band repeater. And that allows us to use the space station as our own, basically, communication satellite. Uh, you can send the signal up to it and the repeater s sends the signal back down uh, to Earth. But obviously, the space station is moving, so it's not above you all the time. But you can get really interesting uh, contacts through that. Um, that aren't normally uh, reliably possible so like transatlantic or uh, to, to other parts of, of the world that are being covered by the space station at that time anyway it's a myriad of different things yeah, there's so many uh, possibilities uh, in, in uh, radio communications it's a great hobby and it's a great way to learn about science and technology and engineering and maths and um, it's a good gateway into that okay so that's it um hope you enjoyed that video and uh, uh you know we're going to put this video up on youtube and you can ask questions there too uh, and that will be on our club channel and true dublin maker as well and uh, we're happy to answer any questions around any aspects of the code and weather satellite images or anything else to do with uh, communications uh, related to amateur radio Okay, so this is Adrian signing off, um, um, and see you soon. Bye. Uh, okie dokie. Um, 
going to be Q and A time. Uh, so there's going to be a bit of delay because we're doing it through Zoom. So um, uh, so there's a little wee delay that goes to YouTube. So people kind of um, will. There's a kind of few questions and answers being done during live chat. So we'll probably uh, um, you can actually read through those. Um, I suppose we'll ask the questions that came after the ones that were answered in live chat. Um, now let me see which is the first one. Um, Seems like everyone, like, <laughs> I know this earlier, uh, 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 I see uh, Nathan from Crafty Nation says, uh, like your Voyager background. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, sorry, I'm just scrolling down. Um, well, I can, uh, I'm going past. I like that question from Laura, though, about have you found that wow signal? Yes, and that you are waiting for ET to DM you. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, how, um, so Laura has a question. Like, um, Laura, do you want to ask that? Like, um, the one for like about the license. Hey, Laura. No, oh, can't hear you. Hold on, give me a sec. No, can you? No, go me? for it. Go for it. Um, I know you mentioned the license at the beginning, and I missed a bit. But how do you apply for a license, and how much does it cost? Do you have to do any uh, training, or? And Adrian is muted. Yeah, Adrian's muted. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, the licensing system is handled by, yeah, the, the licensing system is, uh, Laura, is handled, handled by Comreg. So they're the communications regulator in Ireland. Um, there's only one class of license uh, in many other countries. There's a stepwise way of doing it, but we just have the single tier uh, license, um, which gives you permission to transmit across different parts of the radio spectrum. Um, it's not a very onerous exam. It's it's split into two parts. There's a technical paper and what they call basically like a, an operations paper. So basically how you behave when you're transmitting on air and etiquette when you're on air and that kind of stuff. Um, the technical paper is, I Derma can chip in here, it's pretty basic now. It's like once you know Ohm's law, and even if you don't know Ohm's law, if you just write down the little diagram for it when you get into the exam, you'll be able to answer most of the maths questions anyway. Um, and you would have to know a little bit about antenna and, uh, construction. Um, the architecture of a basic transmitter and the architecture of a basic receiver. Um, is there anything else, Dermot? No, I think you covered it completely there, uh, Adrian. Mm -hmm. the, um, there is a lot of information on the, uh, the, the uh, lead society is the uh, IRTS. So it'll be at uh, www.irts.ie and they give all the details of the exams uh examination so uh i'd i'd recommend that for a, a slow read you might find uh, uh an area that interests you there it's not expensive either it's like i'm not sure it's probably around 30 or 50 quid or something yeah. like that I think. Um, they have the exam twice or three times a year and the... i'm actually at the moment and um, they're bringing the exam to different parts of the country, I think, aren't they, Dermot? They're setting That's them right. up in different yep. hotels and That's right. trying to get out there. Normally, you'd have to go to Comreg's HQ down on um, on the Keys, uh, down near the, uh, the, the the conference center. Um, but they're actually getting out there. They've held some in Galway, I think Cork as well. So um, coming to a town near you. <laughs> <laughs> and do you yeah. have to renew it each year or? No. Once and off. Generally, once you have a full license, it's it's a lifetime license. Fantastic. You have to keep a log. OK, so you, you have to log every time you transmit. And um, that's a that's a regulation. Uh, so. You know, it, it's just it's just there. I, the enforcement regime behind it. It's more if there, I'd say if there was a complaint or something like that by uh, like if someone's Broadband's being knocked out for five kilometers or something like that. Um, although I, I, I doubt that would happen. But uh, yeah, you have to keep a log. That, that's important because you like my call sign, as you can see there, my name is like it's or it's EI9HAB. That's my station call sign. 
So it's like the same when it, when you look at a, an Irish aircraft that says EI, whatever, that, that's its radio call sign. So you're considered a station, you know, so. Oh, so thank you. I think you kind of answered it. <laughs> Nathan asked, like, how do you, how did, I suppose, how do you both go, um, get into radios? Oh, you go, Dermot. Um, yeah. <laughs> in, my, in my case, it was actually very, a long time ago because uh, I grew up in Navan County Meath and uh, my neighbour was a very smart radio amateur. He was also a radio TV dealer. But uh, we listened to uh, about the 12th of uh, October in 1957. We heard, uh, we could hear the Sputnik for, and uh, uh, listen to the beep beep from that. And I'm afraid that is responsible for the rest of my life. Unfortunately, I couldn't. Uh, done some decent profession but instead i got hooked on this stuff yeah and um i'm involved in amateur radio let what less than three years um and uh i was just interested i don't know how i came across it i actually brought my dad bought my dad a shortwave radio for for his retirement and i said uh, i'll buy one myself and i started tuning around and then i bought one of those software to find receivers and it just it just opened up this entire v invisible world that's there you know we don't pay it any attention most of the time but there's just so much stuff flying around and um then i went down to the guys in south dublin radio club and dermot was there and uh got brought into the fold and then went did the exam Um actually just on, on the exam thing i studied for that myself in what three or four months it was it was you know just a little bit of application and it wasn't too too difficult to pass laura you have a question there uh sorry yeah you just brought it up there your call sign are you assigned it or do you create it yourself so there's i don't Dermot can correct me this there's no what they call vanity call signs like they have in the states and stuff <laughs> where, where you can <laughs> you can rearrange the letters for yourself uh uh, I don't think so, Dermot. Is there? Yeah, there, there is. Yeah, it, is it there? can. It, in theory, in theory, it can happen. They probably now charge uh, uh, for it, but I think most of us are so glad to get it. Uh, we think that, that we accepted anything, but uh, yeah, I'm sure they're probably more flexible there. But they probably charge for it to get out of sequence. So, so just on the call signs, you get you uh, Dermot's call sign is E I seven F Z, which is one letter shorter than mine. So there is there's a there's a bit of a um, pecking order within radio. So Dermot um, has Morse code, <laughs> 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 and that's a separate uh, test once you get your license. And um, I, I'm not there yet. <laughs> so. I think um, I remember you like earlier um, in the video when you're setting up, you said everyone should know their own. Was it was it a broadcast signal or your frequency? Like you just mentioned that, but you never actually said how, oh. how, how you find that out. You said that everyone who uses radio would know, but for someone oh, who doesn't. Your, your latitude and longitude. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you, that's a station stipulation as to your fixed station as to where you are in the world. <laughs> Um, and right. so you you would know and plus a lot of the uh, Dermot would my pitch on this as well a lot of the the software and that that we use now is is contingent on your geographic location you know a lot of the calculations that we would use um to calculate like our signal propagation from where our points to other parts of the world you know that's the that's the um the information that the software would use that's that that would be right Dermot, wouldn't it that, that, that that's correct and uh, it's um, uh, yeah it's uh, basically everybody has it and a lot of people uh, a lot of uh, people chase uh, the squares uh, if you like that uh, they've broken the whole world into to squares so some people chase it uh, via via squares and uh, for instance if I was making a contact with with somebody uh say in North America on a sat satellite, he would say what square he is. And then I can refer to the map behind me instantly and say, bang, yes, that's, that, that's, that's, that's where, he, where it is. It's, uh, it just simplifies the um, longitude and latitude. It breaks it down into uh, 
two letters and uh, four four characters. So uh, it uh, just to make it uh, uh, easier, and it 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 sounds simpler over the air as well because you can use the phonetic code. You know, say DJ four disc jockey four, and then it's more uh, it, it's more legible for someone to listen to. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, there hasn't been any coming in. Yeah, on the last I have chat. a question there oh. for Aiden. Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, what sort of changes would you make to that antenna design if you're going to leave it outside for six months? Like what weatherization strategy or how would you protect it from the weather? Well, I, I, Dermot might have views on this as well. I wouldn't use a chocolate block connector for a start. <laughs> <laughs> you could use the chocolate block, but um, yes. you'd seal it. You'd see. You'd, you'd seal it up. Uh, yeah. Obviously, you put it in a tiny um, project box or something like that, and uh, or else uh, you can get liquid rubber now that you can spray it, and it will uh, make it uh, completely insulated. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Once, once it, if it was in a little box, and then there's just other just ways of doing it. You could use kind of harder connections i suppose and solder together um but that, yeah as long as as long as the end of the coax is weatherized you just don't want yeah. water getting into the coax that's, that's where it gets really practical because weather in ireland uh is a challenge all of the time mm -hmm. um is that everything laura no, I, I, I can go on oh, uh, can go you for it. guys tell me what would be the Say, what would be the typical distance you'd be communicating with people? Are we talking different places in Europe? You Dermot mentioned America there. That seems far away. So um, um, we have a new it, solar cycle for shortwave. So I don't know if sunspots affect radio communication quite a lot. Um, and uh, Dermot has many more years experience with me. But for example, on a low powered relatively low power digital transmission which is basically setting out bits of data um i got queensland there um a few weeks ago so but dermot will tell you he go ahead yeah no no he he's done better than i have i've never worked queensland but uh, no it depends what I, it's it's one of the areas that there are so many facets uh to it. Uh, for instance, some people are interested in what they call high frequency. So it's between medium wave and up to 30 megahertz. I'm more interested in uh, amateur satellites because there's uh, a number of uh, satellites in low earth orbit and uh, various countries and universities and so on have, have put them up and uh, you can communicate uh, via, via them and uh, some are just on uh, FM and some of what they call on sideband that they're, they, they become tricky to uh, track because they're moving across the sky and uh, you're tracking uh, frequency for Doppler and you're also moving uh, an antennas to, to track them as well. So it can be, uh, it can be fun and uh, challenging, you know. But the one thing about this hobby is you are always learning. It's a, it was described as self-training and uh, you spend your entire life uh, uh, learning. But there are so many aspects to it from amateur television to some guys never uh, get away from Morse code. It become, has become popular again over the lockdown. People started learning, learning it again, which uh, went out of commercial use uh, more, over 10 years ago. Uh, other people are into just data only. They never open their mouth. Other people never touch. They wouldn't believe in it. So there's there's so many aspects to it. And then we have, I suppose it being science week on the, the short wave or the, the what they're called the high frequency end of the spectrum. We're completely dependent on the state of the, of the ionosphere, um, which is ionized by the sun. And the solar cycle is very much part of that so we're just coming out of solar minimum which was is bad for shortwave radio i suppose um, and now there's more sunspots so that ionosphere is more ionized um, and signals propagate better but even within that it depends on the frequency of the signals so you've different bands 
and they're actually kind of good for want of a better ter- term for different uh, ranges of communication for want of a better phrase um like there's some good ones that are general for world worldwide coverage others are better for shorter range um you know and then you're open to vhf uhf super high frequencies people are experiment with microwave communications and all, all sorts of different things it's just as Dermot said, it's fast, you know. I've got a question from Nathan. Uh, ever heard anything you could not explain? <laughs> so there, Dermot has um, more experience time-wise, I suppose, but there are strange things out there. So there are things called number stations that people come across. Most radio amateurs aren't that interested in them. I, I like them. I like when I come across them. Um, they were quite um, prominent during the Cold War, uh, where you would just hear, they're either data streams or actually um, uh, machine voices reading out strings of numbers. Um, and no one claims to broadcast them and no one claims to receive them. Um, so, but if you Google number stations, you'll find stuff on them. Um, there's one in particular um, called the buzzer, which is on shortwave, it's on, uh, four six two five kilohertz i know it off by heart and it just goes it just buzzes constantly and nobody knows why it's been there for 30 years <laughs> and there is i'd forgotten all about the number stations i years ago i used to as as a kid i used to be fascinated uh, by them but uh, i didn't realize they were they were still going yeah they're still there in yeah. german and english and chinese yeah um Increasingly in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> some guys, so, uh, some guys got a great kick out of uh, uh, tracking a lot of the um, uh, what the powers the mili- you get military radars and uh, things like that, and they come on and they cause they don't recognize amateur uh, frequencies, and um, that uh, a lot of people then uh, have spent time uh, tracking down exactly. Uh, where they are by reading the waveform uh, as they received it and then working their way back uh, via Google Earth or what have you. You know, they have tracked them to the most obscure parts of Siberia and uh, and China. But these guys are uh, really something else. Uh, they're um, better mathematicians and geographers than anything else. You know, it's a, it's a real, um, it's a serious, it's equivalent of the, the crosshair crossword. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so we're we're like nearly. So uh, I just have one more. Wait, just one more. Okay. It's, it's okay. I can't, I can't, I can't stop asking <laughs> Go questions. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, I guess. Uh, what impact do you think computers has had on the hobby of amateur radio? They've had an enormous uh, impact, and um, uh, I got first computer in. Um, 1984 and the main thing it caused to the radio was uh, interference and uh, yes nothing nothing has changed the advent of computers and uh, even with uh, all the regulations is uh, it is uh, it would they can still cause interference but as against that I use them uh, two computers in the shack I mainly operate um, I use uh, one of them for uh, keeping a track of the, the satellites when the satellites are going to be over and uh, tells me the altitude, elevation, and um, where, they, where they are. Um, I also use it for, I use a lot of data. Um, we try, uh, the, the sort of the latest uh, a query from, say, instead of Morse code now, they would use data, which is error corrected and error free and will work down into the serious noise that you, where you cannot hear, but you would still be able to decode it. And um, it is a, 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 just for the sake of just, just letting you know the name, it's a stuff called uh, FT8. And uh, it was uh, devised by uh, um, a, um, a physicist, um, uh, an award-winning uh, physicist who won the Nobel Prize in Princeton University, but uh, even uh, Nobel you know, uh, winners uh, get hooked up on this, and uh, they have this 
uh, device, this thing, which oddly enough took over uh, as uh, Adrian pointed out during the low sunspot cycle, reception has been very bad for the last number of years. There normally the solar cycle is about 11 years, but we were at a, a minimum. And uh, instead of guys uh, talking on voice, they all gravitated uh, onto the system of uh, FT8, which is basically it ends up with the computers just talking to each other, which is uh, really no good. The social aspect has gone out of it altogether. Sorry about that long answer. And if I just add, like, this was in a more future looking way, I mean, why would you need amateur radio when we're speaking on Zoom and all that kind of stuff? I suppose there is that social element of radio. Um, and what's the hook for the younger generation? Um, and it's a huge debate within radio, actually. Um, and say, uh, one of the main things coming out now, obviously, we're in this kind of fourth industrial revolution. And um, we'll have smart cities, um, you know, autonomous vehicles, all, all that kind of stuff. That's all completely dependent on radio, on signals going through the air. So how all these devices, you know, will communicate with each other, you know, how we set up this future society for reliability and so on. So radio has morphed, you know, and in actual, the, in actual fact, the old term for radio is probably more apt for the younger generation because my grandfather used to listen to the wireless. You know, so it's that kind of whole wireless technology thing. Um, and I suppose, uh, uh, yeah, you could see maybe the younger generation getting into amateur radio and maybe gravitating towards that hybrid of technologies and using shorter range radio communications to get things done. Um, some of which would not be based, you know, you have these parts of the radio spectrum that are basically a free for all that, let, you know, that the radio regulators allow people to have you know, small devices talking to each other or whatever. Um, so that may have to become more regulated as time goes, as long as there's a, a more pro proliferation of this, this type of technology. Because um, ultimately, I suppose, with a less centralized global communication system, you're just going to have lots of little radio nodes of sending out signals all over the place. So how that's going to work and how that will affect amateur radio is anyone's guess, you know. Uh... Laura, do you have a question there? Yeah, sorry. You just brought it to my mind when you talked about the number stations. Have you ever um, came across something that you probably shouldn't have? Or have you ever heard anything interesting? Um, not really. I mean, you, 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 or you, you can't can... talk about it. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there's, there's <laughs> actually in, in some countries. In some countries, it's illegal to listen to certain types of transmissions, but um, not here. I mean, you can hear, like, there's open broadcast stuff all the time. I mean, you can hear, there's US Air Force action messages that are broadcast all the time. You'll hear them on shortwave. Um, they're open, like, there's their voice, but they're coded. Um, anything you shouldn't, I mean, number stations are also used by um, drug cartels. So they reckon anyway, wow. you know. So for boat meetups or whatever, drop off points or whatever. So, you know, there is clandestine radio stuff out there as well, but you wouldn't know what it is when you're listening to it. You know, it's, it's, it would just be gobbledygook and it wouldn't be any form of code that you would recognize. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive um, unseen universe out there, I suppose. Yeah. The dark wireless. That's it, the dark wireless. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So Absolutely. the or order on the dark web and confirmation sent on the dark wireless. <laughs> Uh, years ago, when uh, mobile phones came out, first they were all analog, and uh, you had a number of people who started listening uh, into them, famously into Prince Charles and Princess, uh, um, the parts of the royal family. But then they always described the, the, the sick heads who were listening to it as radio amateurs, which got us a terrible name, so it did. You know, it, it got this image of perverts sitting in shack listening to other people's <laughs> phone conversations. But yeah, gladly that could no longer happen. So uh, yeah. uh, the, it, uh, it, helped, it helped the image. But you, you will hear things on like baby monitors are famously insecure. I think baby monitors can hear other baby monitors like well, my neighbors anyway. Uh, so. yeah, well, this is exactly so. I mean, and it, so if you, you know, if, if you've got a setup, you know, with a fairly decent receiver, you can, but you don't go 
I don't know. There, we don't go looking for that kind of stuff. So no, I mean, it's, it's, not, not, no. What would you, what would you bother for? You know. Yeah, I mean, it's unless something's malfunctioning and intruding on some part of the spectrum that you're listening to, which would be unlikely. But oh, I didn't mean I, I wasn't implying that. No, I just thought like when you're just maybe starting off and you're randomly going through things. Yeah, well, you do come across things, things yeah. randomly. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. But I mean, it depends. I, I said. It depends on the location of manufacture, how well things are made and how secure they are, you know. So it's probably, as a segue, it's probably wise if you have any type of wireless device to kind of understand how it works and um, what the implications might be of you. As I say, you mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the, you know, the next wave is, come, is here and that people have to learn uh, more, more of the basics of foundations actually when it comes to wireless um because it's definitely going to be a security issue <laughs> um yeah. you know people just take it for granted and say hey we can see stuff over wireless and the, so can everyone else you yeah. know uh, so it, it is something i suppose a kind of foundation knowledge now that you need if you're doing something like that especially iot stuff you know you need to know a little bit more um instead of just saying oh it works i did a prototype and it works and then you just fling it out there in the market and then suddenly it's a big news, uh, you know, a cybersecurity issue at that stage. Yeah, yeah. And it's not even, for us, it's not even a cybersecurity issue. You can just listen to it. You know, it's just, you just, <laughs> just it's it's free in the air and it's it's there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a consideration. So um, I suppose uh, we're, we're going to wrap it up. But before we do, um, um, I'm sure you have, I, I want to see if you have any kind of announcements for anyone who might want to kind of attend your kind of upcoming events. Um, yeah. You do a shout out. So, yeah, so um, every Tuesday night we meet on Zoom and that's open to the public at the moment during the pandemic um, at 8 p.m. Uh, we have a Twitter feed, which is uh, South Dublin Radio Club or at SD uh, Radio Club. And you can just DM us there and we'll give you the link to join us. Uh, similarly, we have the same function on Facebook, um, which is South Dublin Radio Club on Facebook. And we also have a website. So you have all those channels to contact us and we will gladly uh, bring you in and um, the last few weeks we've actually had a lot of guest lectures on um, everything from Ireland's first satellite due to launch which is AirSat1 um, and different technical talks uh, tomorrow night we don't have anything particular lined up it's just a club night so uh, maybe on foot of this if someone wants to come in and ask questions in a general sense that would be a great night to do that um, and then we publicize our guest speakers and uh, talks that we generate ourselves um, through the same social media channels. Uh, we're normally based physically in Rathfarnham in Ballyroan uh, Community Center. Um, and that is normally at eight o'clock every Tuesday night. Um, and we have some radio equipment there that we can demonstrate and show people some, um, some basic stuff there. Um, but naturally being amateurs, we have our own equipment at home. Um, so yeah, what, even in these pandemic times, if, if you don't have access to what radio equipment looks like, I mean, we're all set up for webca webcams really at this stage. So we could show you around our own, uh, we call them shacks. That's what we call our radio stations, our own shacks at home. Um, so yeah, so we've, we've multiple avenues that you can approach us and, uh, keep an eye on our Twitter. Just, just, just subscribe to us on Twitter or Facebook and, uh, or the YouTube channel, we have a YouTube channel and you'll get upcoming events um, and we've had some quite good talks the, this, this autumn actually the pandemic has really changed the dynamic I think somewhat in the club where you know we're, 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 uh, we're seeing the possibility of being a bit more active with getting guest speakers in it's a lot easier online actually it's, it's an interesting thing about the pandemic there's mm. been some positive to it in that sense Okay, great stuff um, so I suppose we'll wrap it up now. Um, so thank you again to Adrian and Dermot from the South Dublin Radio Club uh, for, um, you know, sharing your knowledge and, of course, um, you know, your your um, uh, video on building your antenna and capturing, you know, uh, images from passing satellites. Um, thanks to Jeffrey and uh, Laura for um, co-hosting this evening as well, um, because um, there are still going to be minor glitches here and there as we do this. As I say, it's a new area for us. We're all doing this virtual events. So um, I'm going to um, switch over and close off and talk about what's happening tomorrow. And um, and so I'll say goodbye to everyone here now uh, before I go and do the rest of the announcements. 
Yeah, thank Thanks you so much for having us. Thank you. Good night, uh, Vicky. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for listening. God bless. Nice. Uh, so uh, thank you everyone for joining us for this evening session. Um, but tomorrow we will have um, uh, Chris Rana from Maker Meet and he will be um, doing the Paper Tower Challenge. It's going to be on at one, um, uh, one o'clock. Uh, so do hit uh, subscribe, uh, I think subscribe uh, on our YouTube channel and um, and the notification bell if you want to know when the um, video comes live. And uh, uh, we're on all the social media channels as well, um, Double Maker on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So um, thank you again um, for uh, this evening, uh, joining us this evening. And thanks to all the speakers. And uh, yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>